Don, do you think there's an ecosystem in Miami, an art ecosystem in Miami? Um, every place has a, a, an art ecosystem, but they're different. Miami, some places like, for example, Washington, is dominated by the museum's system. Miami tends to be more dominated by the collectors, although now there's going to be more and more active museums, but the museums are often collector-based. But, uh, but uh, what about your museum? It became so institutional, so big, so influential. We prefer not to think of it as institutional. It's big. But you called it museum, which is very yeah. institutional word. Uh, It's, a, it's interesting, actually. My wife, Mira, wanted to call it a museum. I think it, when we called it a collection, people didn't know whether it was a car dealership or a museum. Uh, so it's, by calling it a museum, it's easier to people to deal with it. From our point of view, it doesn't matter. But what, what's special about Miami and why uh, collectors are so prominent here? And you? Space. Both. What does it mean? Uh, you have accessibility to larger spaces, to warehouses. To, compared to a place like New York, the, it's much more reasonable to be able. You, you can enter the system of a, of a space to show off. Uh, I, I, there are artists here, but I, I don't think Los Angeles is still dominated by artists. That's why I had to pick one thing that dominates Los Angeles. I'd have to say the artists in New York, the galleries. Um, Miami is just a strange mixture. It's, it's uh, People tend to build larger here. They have more space to show on. And so it becomes very appealing. Plus, we have a, an amazing transportation system. I live 10 minutes from the airport, so I'm able to go, go yeah. in and out very easily. And so why did you feel the necessity of uh, opening a museum in Washington? Uh, I don't know if you know, my wife is, is not, was not born in America. She was an immigrant who came here. And especially for her, Washington was so important. Thanks, Ash. Washington was so important. Uh, but also it is the capital. And it has an incredible system of museums. Uh, the Smithsonian Museums, I think, number 17. Uh, but they, they're not as concerned with the cutting edge museums. And for, you know, and the work that we collect is really of the moment, so to speak. Maybe five years or 10 years or 20 years or even 30 or 40 now. But it's more of the moment, and we thought it would talk to people more. And particularly, you know, we live in a divisive country right now. You know, sorry? We live in a divisive country. Yes. It's, it's a, you know, people are here and here, and there's very little in the middle. And we actually thought that the, that artists today are making things which would help people to understand their side and the other side. And so there was a room to take, in fact for cutting-edge art in, in Washington? Well, this, we, we have a hotel in Washington, and that's how we be, first became involved with Washington. And then right across the street was a historic black school, a, a, a segregated school, who, as, as it happens, Marvin Gaye, who's a famous American singer, went to school there. And first, there was a teacher there to encourage him to become professional singer and so the the title of our opening show there what's going on came from the Marvin Gaye ah, cool. and it's really concerns what's going on so we deal with things like the artists that deal with race relations and sexual relations isol the sense of isolation and the sense of divisiveness uh, and it varies from artists that are as young as 30 to an artist that's 84 years old And how to, how to manage such a big machine as this museum and the one in Washington, in terms of money? That's a really good question. I'll tell you when we figure it out. <laughs> uh, it's 
especially since all Washington residents can come to that museum for free. So that, yeah, because we really wanted to incorporate the people of Washington into this. Uh, somehow, somehow we've had, to, you know, kind of people sponsored sponsorships. Uh, we're the only primary source of money, but uh, the Knight Foundation just gave us a, a love rather large grant for our resident artisan residency program, which is very important to us. Uh, in Washington, we have various groups. Even the Washington Post came to us and said we'd like to do a lecture series to, with the connection between politics and art, which was a very encouraging thing for us in Washington. And so if we somehow we from here and from there we earn enough and work hard enough to be able to pay for the whole thing. And let's speak about Alexander Diop. That is a good topic. <laughs> he is one of the most talented, talented young but just raw talent, talented artist I've ever seen. He has a unique voice, he's working in a rather unique way. It's interesting, you look at him, you, you have to think of Basquiat. He thinks of Basquiat. But less perturbated than the moon. Yeah, but, uh, um, but dealing the way he deals with materials, the way he is, you know, he's, uh, he comes from a, a French mother, with his Senghalese father, and he now also lives in Vienna. So he has these connections to Paris, to uh, Senegal, and to Vienna. And he's very good at understanding the elements that make a culture, the, the underground of what, what makes a culture work. For me, he's a mix of uh, Dubuffet, Basquiat, with a a whisper of uh, expressionism. There, well, first of all, no one invents art history. And he's very bright. He loves art. He loves artists. And he doesn't hesitate to bring his knowledge of art history, but to communicate in a way that's, that's very local, very regional. He's concerned. <coughs> One of his famous, favorite writers is, is a man by the name of Diop, not related to him. He's a sociologist who deals with the massive effect that African culture has had on, on European culture, both as an early culture and also as through the colonialism process. So, and, and he makes these, I, I've never seen a young artist deal with scale so when, when you go into the room, he, he did a four-month residency, and all the work except two pieces were, were made during this residency. And when you see it, you'll be shocked. I mean, the pieces, two of the pieces are uh, four meters, four or five meters high, and uh, 10 to 12 meters across. They're huge. And he, he really communicates the sensibility of someone who comes from this cross-cultural background. You know, how the, how the hit past was dealt with, but also the future of man. <coughs> but now there's already business about him. His work has, <coughs> his painting has sold already for expensive prices. I, I don't know. That's a, that's a system? Uh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, we're just, we're photographing you. Thank you. Um, you know, when I was a kid I used to collect stamps, and I had something called a Scott book which would tell you the value of the stamps. And when you sold them they were a different value than the book value they had in the book. We have the same issue in art. I don't sell. I yeah, don't yeah. sell my stamps, and I'm not selling my art. <laughs> you so. don't sell any of your art, right? Uh, it's important to say, I think. Uh, I don't think with over seven thousand pieces. I don't think we've sold twenty pieces. Uh, and if we sell it, it's kind of out of desperation, where we have to pay the IRS or something. But when, for example, when an artist come to you for for residency for four months, how does it work? 
to, to work on? We prepay the artist. Uh. And we say, we want you to do something that you've never done before, whatever your dream is. We'll pay you for the work, and whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, you're covered for those nights. We just want you to push to make the best work you can. And it, it works very well because the artist has a sense of freedom. Because if he makes terrible work, it's ours. If he makes good work, it's ours. And we've had enormous luck with the artists in making really outstanding work during the residency. And Alexander was probably one of the most uh, rewarding, if you will. I mean, mm. just, uh, the work was just phenomenal. And I think you'll see as you go into the room, it's, to think that a 27-year-old can make such sophisticated work is amazing. And the incredible thing is that uh, two nights ago we had 6,000 people at an opening here. And whether young or old, or from here or there, they all responded to it. And that ultimately is the test of all. It's not what I feel, it's what people feel. You know, what history, what people, history is just people, how people respond to it. And he happens to be one of the nicest, nicest people I've ever met, which helps because I can't say that about every artist. <laughs> that's for sure. That, that's for sure. I mean, I'll give you one. I have to, I love this story. At the end of the opening, he'd been on his feet for about 10 hours, and we were all absolutely exhausted. And we had made a catalog for the opening, and he insisted on making a drawing in the catalog for each person who worked here. And he knew them all by name, and they, they were caricatures in which he, he, they all knew who they were, and he insisted on giving it to them. So when you talk about the market, the market make here, he doesn't care. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci. But please, make it your business to go and